Good morning, everyone. The known world is my domain, and I am about to make it everyone's problem. Three young lions had brought down an aurochs. The cacophonous ordeal took almost 15 minutes, and unfortunately, they won't be able to reap the benefits of their effort. As hissing and screaming swarms from all sides, they are about to learn why most Chimeran big cats target smaller prey than themselves that they can easily drag out of reach. The common cockatrice is the most widespread and successful mesopredator in Chimere. Excellent endurance and impressive armaments certainly help, but the real key to their dominance is a fission-fusion lifestyle. They live in large groups, but usually hunt alone. However, while hunting solo, they are usually within eyesight of another member of their flock. As they fan out, gulping down anything small that they can catch, they are ever on the lookout for any vulnerabilities in local megafauna. If any creature shows signs of infection, injury, or sickness, the cockatrices will assemble and mob the prey. This also applies to scavenging, when a predator brings down a kill, cockatrices often swarm, with one becoming five and then twenty. Although Megaraptorans are the apex predators of Chimere, and their supremacy means that the predators like lions can't hope to defend their kills, it is actually the cockatrice which overwhelms them and forces mammal predators to burrow or cache in trees. Cockatrices need little food and reproduce extremely quickly, and feeding mostly on small game means that they come to fight stronger than predators that regularly expend their energy with more challenging kills. The common cockatrice is comparable in size to Deinonychus, if a bit bigger. Females average slightly larger, while males tend to have more ornate headgear, although females are equally combative, so have pressures for display. They have a pair of struts on either side of their jaws that flare out when the jaws are opened, making for intimidating threats. While the standard morph has red plumage, black-feathered cockatrices are common, especially in forested habitats. Although by far the most successful Eudromaeosaur, as their name suggests, the common cockatrice is not the only member of this clade in the known world. Dromaeosaurs have been in Chimere since the Jurassic period, Eudromaeosaurs came to the known world in the early Cretaceous and swiftly became the dominant small predators wherever they went. Some became semi-aquatic, others arboreal, but most were small ambush predators that kill prey with astonishing agility, leaping atop game, and using clawed wings to stay mounted as they dug in with tooth and notorious sickle claw. On every continent they reached, they became the dominant mesopredators, as was the case on Earth having the longest tenure in this niche of any animal I've encountered in my studies. There are many clades of Eudromaeosaurs in Chimere. Today I want to focus on the group that makes up a majority of these animals in the known world, the cockatrices. Cockatrices share a common ancestor on the eastern continent around 30 million years ago. What separates them from other Eudromaeosaurs is a fused ankle. Most dromies and indeed all I'm aware of in Earth's fossil record, have separated metatarsals. This is the ancestral or basal condition. Also likely assisted them with foot flexibility, which would have been helpful in the raptor prey restraint model that is currently the leading theory for prey capture among eudromaeosaurs, and is the one used by non-cockatrices. The fused ankle in cockatrices was a trade-off of agility for improved endurance and speed. While classic dromies were undoubtedly swift animals, maybe not having cheetah speed like certain franchises imply, but being proficient ambush predators, they wouldn't have been nearly as efficient over distances as, say, tyrants or ornithomimids, both of which had fused ankles. This strengthens the foot, especially with its oval cross-section, from front to back stride. A similar shift to fused ankles is seen in the robust monarchs, the megaraptorans which currently dominate the apex predator niche. Unlike the raptor prey restraint model, cockatrices kill their prey by first establishing a bite, 
then stabbing one or both sickle claws wherever the bite landed. This reflex to pierce helps them deliver wounds in the thick of a brawl, which often follows a long chase. Although the pursuit can take a while, kills from a cockatrice are often swift, with a few stabs to vital areas leading to death by shock and blood loss. This can be dangerous when tackling larger prey or competing predators, but cockatrices don't seem to mind a challenge. This is similar to what some have proposed the famous fighting dinosaurs, wherein a velociraptor may have had its wing in the jaws of a protoceratops, but its sickle claw is deeply embedded in the ceratopsian's throat. They may not have a bone-crushing bite, but cockatrices are notorious for processing bone in the dry season by virtue of their serrated teeth and a furious sawing motion. We see a potential evidence of this behavior in Deinonychus biting into Tenontosaurus bones. One would be hard-pressed to argue that the slender Deinonychus was chewing through bone. Because of this, cockatrices can make the most of what little meat they can find, a trait exceptionally useful on the housey prairies, which become functionally desertified in the dry season. Becoming endurance hunters, or pursuit predators, proved especially beneficial to cockatrices in the aftermath of the dynastic extinction. Initially, forests spread unchecked after the extinction of the old titanosaurs, but new titans came along and made open forests dominant once more, and many prairies were spread and supported by parksosaurs and ungulates, both from the earlier Oligocene harvest and for more recent harvests from Earth. In both open forests and prairies, endurance hunting proved highly advantageous, and cockatrices quickly dominated the small predator niche of the eastern continent. They first came to the known world around 12 million years ago, when the northern continent reached the east. Reaching the known world required not only crossing the island chain, it also meant crossing the equator, a barrier of heat that restricts the migration of many animals. Cockatrices, however, are perfectly suited to deal with heat. Although their feathers have insulating properties, they are much lighter than they appear, and their primary function is to provide shade to cool the skin. They also have extensive air sacs, which is typical of dinosaurs, helping to further keep them cool as well as complementing their endurance adaptations. Not all cockatrices employ the fission-fusion hunting method I described with the common species. In fact, most are solitary. The ancestor of the modern green cockatrice was the first of this clade to be successful in the known world. At the time, titanosaurs were only just starting to clear out what at the time was dense jungles making up the majority of the northern continent. These smaller cockatrices were still in the shadow of other dromaeosaurs and didn't dramatically impact the ecosystem. They are only found today in the dense angiosperm jungles of the Crescent. The next wave of cockatrices reached the known world around 8 million years ago. These were much more social animals. A now extinct larger species became top mesopredator, but this legacy is best known from the hound cockatrices. These dromies were so named for being the earliest example of possible domestication. Like water thick knees bonding with Nile crocodiles, this alliance with robust megaraptorans was initially to benefit both. The cockatrice defends the nest from small raiders, like nontherian mammals and mustelids, while the Megaraptoran provides food to supplement the little critter diet and sees off more substantial threats. This bond developed in what it is seen as today, a partnership wherein the most successful females of either species are those who have a nesting partner. There are some of both who are alone, but the benefits of this relationship are clear in how common it is. Although the larger members of this wave of cockatrice were later outcompeted, the smaller ones are quite common, bonding with the Zentar and Orotaku, and being found throughout most of the known world. This bond is not necessary for the Uktan, given that they have longer parental care, and these subadults serve the function of these dromies. One genus arrived and truly dominated in this landscape. This genus includes the common cockatrice which, as its name suggests, is the most successful member of this group. They are found in most of the known world, having outcompeted many other predators and forcing the survivors into specialization. The black cockatrice is the largest of this genus. It is a solitary hunter, preferring to target cursorial ungulates like deer in the Titan Gardens. The Fosnu, or running vulture, is the most common cockatrice on the Housie Prairie. 
Some of their prey is colorblind and cannot see their vibrant blue crests. Others can, but the cockatrice is known to use this to their advantage to scare prey to run, which benefits these endurance specialists happy to casually jog behind until their target collapses. Perhaps most interesting about the running vulture is their penchant to bond with common hyenas. Both animals are built for endurance, but the Fosnu can run longer while the hyena is faster. Working together leads to more successful hunts of either species, especially as hyenas grapple the target and the Fosnu will go for the throat. This partnership developed on the eastern continent and was brought with them to the known world as both species came around a million years ago. Largest and most striking of the cockatrices is the Okos, or Scavenger King. As their name suggests, these animals have invested a lot in intimidating features. Scent glands make them smell like death, they're bristling with quills, and their facial integument strongly resembles entrails. Cockatrices of all kinds spread their wings to assert themselves at a kill, but the Okos takes this to an extreme and any who get too close are given a sharp reminder of who's boss. They aren't common, but when they jog up to a kill, all but the Uktan will step aside as the Scavenger King has his feast. There are two Eudromaeosaurs in the known world, not technically in the Cockatrice Clade, but the common names of both do lump them into the group. Most common is the pheasant cockatrice, a relic of the ambush hunters that once dominated. It is the smallest chimera in Eudromaeosaur, specialized in rodents but will occasionally tackle prey as large as a young boar. Perhaps the strangest chimera in Eudromaeosaur is the white cockatrice. This large predator is a notorious mountain specialist. They are the apex predator of the Crescent Mountains. Although they cannot fly, they are proficient gliders, dropping down onto prey from astonishing height and subduing them with powerful bite and deep piercing claws. Firebirds were once believed to be Eudromaeosaurs, but Chimera naturalists currently classify them as true birds. Their ancestor was an animal similar to Archaeopteryx. Even so, most Chimerans consider Aldromaeosaurs and even Megaraptorans birds, so to say their cladistics are complicated is an understatement. Even with this confusion, firebirds are not considered within the cockatrice clade. With rapid reproduction, adaptable sociality, impressive armaments, and almost supernatural endurance, the cockatrices have become a determining factor in the cast of predator and prey in the known world. They are responsible for much of the diversity and pressure for predators to specialize if they want to survive. Although not without challengers, the cockatrices are proof that dinosaurs are still evolving and are still major players in the competitive ecologies of Chimere. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to one of my favorite dinosaurs. As I assume is the case for many of you, Jurassic Park was my introduction to dromaeosaurs and I've been fascinated by them ever since. Really proud of how this one came together. Thank you to my new patrons couldn't do this many videos without your support, and special shout out to Shiny Gander and Jay Stocky for contributing some fantastic artwork for this episode. Alright, got a lot to do for the gliding video, and then it's off to the Oligocene. Cheers folks!